let me see all your shiny smiley faces and we can begin. Um, thank you everyone for coming. We apologize for the delay in this, um, in this budget hearing. Normally it would be incumbent upon us house members to blame the Senate. In this case, it would be completely accurate. Uh, but uh, we are, this is what we are dealing with now that we are having the joint budget hearings and obviously working with two separate two separate chambers and two separate floor sessions that sometimes run late. So we do apologize, but we wanna move forward with the budget hearing for the Department of Human Services overview budget. Um, we are going to proceed the way that we normally do with this beginning with the uh, analyst report. So Grace, if you can share your screen and then take it away. After that, we will move to um, the response from the department and then uh, to any public testimony. Before we begin, I do wanna again remind folks, um, we had a ton of people sign up to testify on this budget, which is highly unusual since this is an overview budget. Um, we suspect now that some of those folks may have accidentally signed up on the wrong committee in the wrong um, budget bill hearing. Uh, so if you are here to testify on the Essential Workers Act, that is in economic matters, that is not this, um, this hearing. So uh, we will go through, we will call on people just to make sure, uh, but if you are signed up for the wrong thing, please note that we are happy to have you move over. So with that, uh, hand it over to Grace and the overview of the budget, thank you. Sorry, I got muted there. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's my pleasure to present the Department of Human Services Fiscal 22 Budget Overview. Um, so I'll start with this first graph showing uh, the total budget, uh, which decreases about 800 million, um, over 800 million actually, from the fiscal 2021 working appropriation, um, which is mostly driven by a decrease in uh, SNAP. So going on to the next exhibit, uh, this shows a breakdown of the agency's spending, um, about half of which is for public assistance, uh, followed by personnel, and then each of the major um, human services administrations. Okay, going on to the next page, this is um, showing the all funds change um, from the fiscal 2022 working uh, allowance to the fiscal 2021 working appropriation. Um, there's well, some things remain level funded. Um, there's some significant uh, changes on a couple areas like uh, TCA decreases more than 26%. And that's mostly because the caseload is expected to decline in fiscal 22. And um, there's a temporary $100 benefit uh, in fiscal 21 that ends at the end of that fiscal year. Um, another caseload decline um, is expected in SNAP, uh, decreasing that funding by about 40%. Um, a notable increase is for IT, um, which increases 15% across all funds, but uh, that understates the general fund impact a little bit, um, shown here at the bottom. And that's mostly because the um, department's major IT project, MD Think, is moving from development, which gets a relatively higher uh, federal fund match, to um, maintenance and operations, which gets a, a lower federal match. Another uh, significant general fund change is for uh, TCA, which decreases uh, 41%. So going on to the proposed budget changes towards the bottom of this page on um, page seven, um, the SNAP uh, decrease alone accounts for 800 million of the 822 million um, decrease from fis the fiscal 21 working appropriation. Um, and that's aligning fiscal 22 funding with the fiscal 2020 actual. Other significant decreases occur for TCA um, that temporary $100 benefit um, accounts for 37 million of the change and the decreasing caseload accounts for about 22 um, million of the decrease. So on page nine, here are the caseloads that I was talking about. Um, TCA is expected to decrease 13% uh, and then SNAP is expected to decrease 19%. 
Um, another significant change in the budget is that 127 positions are going to be abolished in the fiscal 2022 uh, allowance. And uh, DHS indicates that all of those positions were long-term vacant positions, um, and it won't have any effect on uh, service delivery or operations. Um, oh, and most of the uh, decrease occurs in family investment. Okay, so going on to the first issue, my colleague Tanya Zimmerman is going to present this. Thank you. If you uh, turn to exhibit one, uh, this um, presents information on the caseload for the, for the primary um, public assistance programs in um, DHS. Uh, as you can see, the caseloads among all, uh, all three of these case types increased uh, fairly dramatically at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, there was a significant surge in applications um, for the SNAP uh, caseload and the TCA caseload in April. Uh, the Temporary Disability Assistance Program, or TDAP, didn't have the same kind of surge in applications, but nevertheless, the caseload increased. And these uh, caseload increases kind of peaked in uh, June or July, and then they again fell fairly dramatically. Uh, so part of what happened is that um, with the pandemic, um, there were additional flexibilities provided to states um, to um, help people access benefits and maintain benefits. So uh, DHS received approval from USDA uh, to extend recertifications for um, six, six month extensions of recertifications for the period uh, March through May. The Family First Coronavirus Response Act allowed um, states to continue that for an additional month through June. Uh, DHS did not uh, seek an additional extension after that um, period and as you can see, the caseloads began to decline um, fairly significantly after that. Um, so that by October, the number of SNAP recipients had declined by about 23%. Uh, well, and TCA recipients um, between July and November decreased by about 18%. Uh, when they began, um, they began to have the recertification extensions again in October as a result of the Continuing Resolutions um, Act, which authorized states to undertake um, those kind of flexibilities on their own initiative without uh, seeking approval of USDA. Uh, again, so the department is uh, extending recertification periods between October 2020 and March 2021, and will begin uh, recertifying again in April. Um, and following that, uh, the caseloads began to rebound um, for SNAP. They began to stabilize um, for TCA. However, the Temporary Disability Assistance Program continued to fall. Um, the caseload in December it, it, of 7,500 is well below the pre-pandemic level. Uh, it's 37% below where they were back um, prior to the pandemic in February. Uh, so we're going to take a little bit of a look at what happened during the um, period when they were recertifying, since this is something that will come up again in just a few months. So if you look at Exhibit 2, uh, this is SNAP closures by week, um, and this covers the period when they started recertifications and, and some more recent information. So you these, see these kind of one-week spikes, and that's when the recertification um, periods really uh, hit the caseload. And during those weeks, uh, more than 90% of the closures were due to failure to reapply. If you turn to um, exhibit three, this is the TCA uh, case closures by reason. So it's a little bit of a different look at um, the case closures, but I would note that the case closures um, increased compared to what they were um, in fiscal 2020 before the pandemic. Um, and the reason for the case closures changed. So before the pandemic in fiscal 2020, the, the largest um, areas of reasons why cases closed were work-related, so kind of work sanctions, or not providing documentation or non-cooperation. In the initial months after the recertification started, uh, the more than 40% of the closures were due to failure to reapply, um, and it exceeded 50% of the reason of the case closures in September. In October, when they began to um, have extensions of the recertifications again, 
the um, income being too high was the primary reason for the case closures, which might be expected um, since the economy has improved. Exhibit four presents similar information for the Temporary Disability Assistance Program. Um, in this uh, program, again, the number of case closures were higher after they restarted recertification and failure to reapply was a leading cause of the case closures for um, the July, um, August and September period. Uh, in June, there was a different issue that happened in the initial months of the pandemic, they extended the time for which uh, individuals had to present a verification of a, the medical certification that they are disabled. Um, and that expired in June. And as you can see, uh, nearly 80% of the case closures in that month were due to um, not having that documentation. Um, and in that month, it's important to know that I mean, access to doctors was still fairly limited. Um, so there was significant difficulty for recipients in um, getting that certification. But the case counts, unlike the other programs, continued to decline. And DHS indicates that there are additional factors that have played a role, um, in particular, a unique trend of recipients not securing a final disability determination from the medical provider, so that medical certification issue, and a lower than typical approval rate for applications. So the cases that close aren't able to reopen um, like they are in the other programs. Uh, we have also noticed um, in, in a couple of the more recent months that there's a larger than um, typical number of recipients hitting a um, short-term time limit in the program of nine months. Um, but if we go back to the approval rates, uh, the application approval rates for TDAP were less than 10% between, uh, for each month between August and October. And that's primarily related to not providing documentation, um, including the medical documentation. DHS indicates the documentation is impacted by factors um, that um, include access to technology and higher rates of housing instability, which makes um, mailing documents um, difficult. And um, in addition, we would note that um, access to medical care, particularly for individuals uh, who may be at higher risk of COVID or for COVID complications, likely uh, plays a significant role um, in their ability to get that medical cert certification. Um, the department um, indicates that they cannot waive that requirement because it's uh, in statute. However, they did extend the time by which people had to provide that certification early in the pandemic, and the governor has waived uh, many other statu statutory requirements in the past year. And so it's unclear why um, such an extension cannot be granted now. And we've asked the agency to comment on um, the extent to which access to physicians makes uh, to make the disability determinations has factored into the closures and the application denials and whether they've asked the governor to waive the documentation requirement. Um, so as we plan um, for the end of the recertification, um, Exhibit 5 um, provides information that the department presented at a hearing that the Health and um, Social Services uh, Subcommittee held in December on the number of recertifications that they were anticipating um, by month after um, the restart of recertifications. They also noted that they were reaching out um, to recipients that um, previously had not um, that had their cases had closed if they had not reapplied um, to try and um, get them back on the rules if they were still eligible. Um, we've asked the department to comment on the status of those efforts and their plans to transition at the end of the extension period um, to limit the likelihood that the drop off in recipients happens again. Uh, DLS is also recommending committee narrative requesting information on case closures. Um, that uh, recommendation will be contained in the Family Investment Administration analysis. And I'll turn it back over to Grace for the remainder of the analysis. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so now we just have two more things to bring to your attention. The first has to do with the outcomes of uh, TCA receipt. 
So in Exhibit 6, you can see that um, during the pandemic, the TC8 caseload is significantly increased. Um, but just 14% um, of people that um, utilized TCA in the early months of the pandemic had prior experience with the program um, in the year um, before they received TCA, indicating that um, people were able to achieve some level of economic stability before the pandemic and then they became eligible for TCA. Um, this exhibit on exhibit, uh, exhibit seven is showing um, the median annual earnings uh, that people received in the year before they received TCA, which is in the green bar, it's um, $6,000, which represents about 35% um, of the federal poverty guideline for a household of two. So the federal poverty guidelines are indicated as like 100% on this exhibit. Then after people received TCA, um, median annual earnings increased um, substantially. So uh, in the first year after they exited TCA, median annual earnings were 11,000. Um, and then five years after exit, it's um, close to 19,000. But this is still um, low, um, e even for just a household of two, it's still very close to the, uh, the federal poverty guideline. Now, full year employment increases earnings substantially, um, but less than 40% of people that exited the TCA program were able to um, attain full year employment before the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so most people that exited TCA um, don't return to the program. Uh, further utilization of TCA um, in the first year after exit and five years after exit is less than 20%. Um, but people do use SNAP and uh, Medicaid in high proportions. Um, so this graph is showing where people are employed. Um, in the first quarter, they're employed after exiting the TCA program um, with relatively small proportions um, of people employed in outpatient healthcare, nursing homes and hospitals. Um, but a lot of um, people are employed in restaurants, general retail, administrative and support industries and other industries. And each of these um, are relatively low income industries. Um, this, that big other industries category makes just um, $3,000 a quarter. And the other industries I mentioned make around 2000, um, give or take. Um, but those, uh, the healthcare industries, hospitals, nursing homes, and out outpatient healthcare um, have significantly higher earnings. But um, as shown in the previous exhibit, they only employ a small proportion of people. Um, so even best case scenario, people um, exited the TCA program five years ago, um, and it's a household of two, and they have full year employment, it's still the median annual earnings are around $25,000. So the entire um, people that exited TCA um, recently within the past five years or so would likely be included in this data. And this data comes from the Census Bureau reporting um, the proportion of households in the state that lost some employment income uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and those households uh, have an income of less than $25,000. And each week the data was reported, uh, more than 40% of households uh, had reported losing some employment income um, during the pandemic. Uh, so that issue is really looking at basically how vulnerable were people that had ex exited TCA in normal times to all the economic instability created by the pandemic. Um, the next issue I have for you is um, related to TNF. So the first exhibit, um, exhibit 12, is showing that the state receives $228 million each year uh, in a TANF grant. And then they receive another um, more than 26 million for contingency TANF that the state qualifies for because of its SNAP caseload. So total revenue each year is about 255 million. Um, and when the state spends um, less than it receives in TANF revenue, it can generate a fund balance. So at the close of fiscal 2019, there was a 40 million fund balance um, and that was left to start off fiscal 20. Fiscal 20 depleted the fund balance by about 20 million and then uh, leaving 20 million for uh, the start of fiscal 21. Fiscal 21, however, completely depleted the fund balance 
um, leaving nothing to start off fiscal 22 with. So this means that in fiscal 22 and likely future years, the state is really gonna have to align its um, TANF spending with the amount of TANF revenue it receives. Otherwise, it risks generating a um, TANF de deficit um, as the state experienced in 2011. Um, in the past, the state, when there was a fund balance available, had used the fund balance to offset some general fund need. Um, here's a look at um, how the TANF funds were spent. Um, so in fiscal 22, uh, there's a notable decrease um, for cash assistance, um, decreasing 24 million, um, but then there's an increase for foster care maintenance payments, and that's mostly because the cost of foster care um, payments increased. Um, the next uh, exhibit is showing how the TANF is going to be spent in fiscal 22 with the largest share being for cash assistance, um, but shown in exhibit 15. Uh, this is gonna be about 42%, which is uh, roughly similar to uh, recent years. The last exhibit I have for you uh, shows the TANF maintenance of effort, uh, which is going to be met. So that concludes my presentation. Thanks for your time today. I'd be happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Um, any questions for the analyst about her report? Delegate Valentino Smith. And just a, a quick question. I just wanna note um, for our purposes, as we look at each of these budgets, this is a budget where more than 50% of the TANF funds are being spent outside the family investment program, right? Are we starting to really trend with more of the TANF funds moving outside family investment? Um, the outside, maybe Tanya could take this. Are we seeing more of a trend, Tanya? Um, so it's, it, it looks a little different this year, um, partly, um, because there is less TANF available. Uh, there is a, a shift in this year's budget, um, to, uh, um, foster care maintenance payments, but in, in addition to the 40%, um, that goes 42% that's for cash assistance. There's, there's still a significant amount of funding that goes for um, work opportunities programs, jobs training um, and, and other family investment needs. So um, I, I'd have to look again to confirm what the actual percent is. I think family investment probably is still over 50% when you combine those other um, factors, I'd have to confirm the actual percent. But there was, um, a shift this year with, with more funding going towards foster care maintenance um, payments um, than, the, than in recent years, um, which is notable, um, particularly as Grace mentioned, since there is less um, TANF funding in the um, budget because the fund balance has been exhausted. Because traditionally the foster care payments had come from the general fund, right? Not come, if we're not using TANF, which... There's also a... a foster care, a federal foster care um, funding source. Um, so it's not, it's not all state um, funding, but it is a significant source. And, and the TANF is, is largely replacing um, general fund need. Thank you. Thank you for the analysis. Thank you, Delegate Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Grace, thanks for the information. I, and uh, forgive me if you brought this up, I was looking at the chart that you showed about folks that how much they were making prior to entering TCA and then year after year um, on average where they're where they're at. Um, did you mention or do we know how we're doing nationally in terms because those are the numbers we want to see. I mean that's what that's what TCA is supposed to do. You're it provides a, a help while you're getting back on your feet and that kind of those numbers show that I think it's working successfully, but how how are we doing nationally in terms of those numbers? Right, that's a great question. Um, I'll have to get back to you after looking at the data, but yeah, I will. Great, I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, um, let's move on to the department and their presentation and response. Thank you, Chairman Riffin and Chairman Resnick for the opportunity to discuss the FY 2022 budget allowance. We're happy to be with you today virtually from our conference room with our mask, social distancing, and other precautions to ensure health and safety. I have my team with me today. 
Gregory James, Deputy Secretary for Operations, Stafford Chipongo, Chief Financial Officer. And in the back, I have Nsani Kibret, Deputy Secretary for Programs, and Lashira Ayala, our Acting Executive Director of the Family Investment Administration. I wanted to take the time to thank Tanya Zimmerman and Grace Pedersen for the comprehensive and concise analysis to, of the HS budget. They're a pleasure to work with and we appreciate all their support. You have my written testimony, which I won't repeat here. However, before I address the two issues, recommendations in the analysis, I would like to take a moment to quickly share our activities and accomplishments at a very high level. In the Family Investment Administration, we manage over 1.5 million cases across all FIA programs. And we have now served over 600,000 more individuals compared to the pre-pandemic case load levels. Under the PEBT program, we're providing more than 214 million in benefits to more than 400,000 children who were eligible for free or reduced price school meals. The PEBT program will continue through September 2021, and we estimate spending an additional $400 million in benefits. On December 17, Governor Hogan announced additional funding to boost TCA benefits from January 21, 2021 to June 2021. Each TCA household will receive an additional 100 per month for each member of the household. We're also implemented a 15% increase in SNAP benefits until June 30th, 2021. In the home energy assistant, we continue to support the, the um, clients that come to us for heating benefits, electrical bill assistance, electrical arrears retirement benefits, and gas arrears retirement benefits. And um, we'll get into more details of how much and what's provided on the household that participated next, next Monday in our OHEP meeting. The critical medical needs program though has been a success and we have trained 298 navigators with 80 more ready to be trained in the coming month. And now we're now focusing on households facing termination due to the end of the moratorium to ensure that they obtain benefits in a timely manner. We're working with the utility companies and our partners for this effort. In child welfare services, 1,105 children achieve permanency, which represents 77% of total exits from foster care. Of these children who receive permanency, 620 were reunified with their families. 225 went to a permanent guardianship home and 260 were adopted. The placement of youth in group settings has decreased from nearly 20% in 27 to 9.5 in 2020. That's a very significant decrease. Entries into foster care decreased by 26% from 20, fiscal year 2019 to fiscal year 2020. And I want to share that in response to the pandemic and its impact on our aging out youth, DHS has adjusted its policy to allow older youth in foster care who normally would have aged out at age 21 to remain in care and continue receiving support. This began in early spring of 2020 and the most recent federal pandemic support legislation would allow this to continue. But Maryland was one of the first states to um, allow the older youth in foster care stay. And of course, we continue to implement our plan for the Federal Family First Prevention Services Act. In Child Support Administration, we continue to collect. Um, last year, we collected 183 million. And of the 183 million, 176 million was distributed to families previously receiving TSA. And we'll get into the numbers um, when we have the Child Support Administration. In MD Thing, we continue implementing MD Thing CGMs. The child welfare system was implemented statewide in fiscal 2020. 
CGM's adult services system will go statewide in the next few weeks. And FIA's new eligibility and enrollment system, and this is the system that touches the SNAP, the TCA, the TDAP benefits, is planned for pilot and program in spring 2021. The new child support application is in final development and is targeted for deployment before the end of 2021. We all know that last year was a challenging year for everyone. At DHS, our motto is, if the services we provided are not enough for our own families, they're not good enough for the people we serve. And to achieve this, we must continue to recognize and seek to understand the specific challenges each of our clients faces as individuals and introduce modern strategies that are tailored to of these differences so that they can be successful. With your permission, I would like to move to address the two issues raised in the Diana analysis. Great, thank you for that overview and please, um, we'd love to hear the response to the two issues. Thank you. In response to issue number one regarding TDAP case closures and denials, the department is committed to make sure that all closed cases are handled properly. The factors behind the increase in case closures and a corresponding decrease in applications approval rates were mainly to, due to challenges in obtaining medical documentation for verifying a disability and eligibility, delays in the US postal service mail delivery. It is difficult for the TDAP population to adjust to not having in-person contact and having to rely on the postal service, which is severely compound, compounded by delays in mail processing. The department did not request an exemption to weigh the documentation requirement. We have examined, examined all these concerns and the department is now reopening any TDAP cases that closed due to failure to provide verification or recertify benefits. It estimates that reopening of this approximately 3,000 TDAP cases will be completed by the end of next week. Through this effort, the beneficiaries will be made good for of all their missed benefits. Moving on to issue number two, regarding the department's effort to prepare for resumption of the recertifications. The Continuing Appropriation Act passed by the United States Congress and signed into law in October, provided a six month extension for her certification due October, 2020 through June, 2021. The extended her certifications will begin in April of this year. The, the department has a plan in place to handle the upcoming through certifications when the waiver expires. We're hiring 90 additional workers to help with the increase in applications I have to say there are four other major parts of our plan. Increased use of online submission and electronic document management to streamline process, changing how we handle some cases so we don't have to recertify as frequently, greater outreach to our clients through multiple channels of communication to encourage them to apply for recertification on time or early and using expert renewals, renewals that don't require new documents for Medicaid cases. Because this is a critical issue, I'd like to share more on each of these approaches, if I may. Using online submission and electronic document management, their recertifications are submitted via mail my DHR online consumer portal will streamline the recertification system to reduce the amount of documents that will have to be entered manually. The good thing is that we're here, we're able to do this enhancement through the MD Think system. With the changes to the system, case managers will be able to process almost double the number of cases they processed previously. We're also handling certifications in a different way. Federal law has allowed us to establish a two-year 
with certification side home for SNAP cases where SSI is the only source of income. 7,000 potentially qualified households have been identified and we're working to grant those households a two year certification cycle through automated eligibility system updates. In addition with, to that, outreach campaign historically, the majority of customers submit recertifications documents within the last two weeks of their recertification map. We have signed an MOU with Benefit Data Trust, one of our SNAP outreach partners to leverage its texting platform. This provides another channel for the caseworkers. And we're also working with our community partners to help, help us encourage our customers to submit their documents on time. And using expert tech, like I said, completing the Medicaid renewals, using documentation available to us without having the client submit any form or document. This concludes my testimony and I'm happy to address any questions the committee may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and thank you to uh, the rest of your panelists. Does anybody else have any comments or are they here just for questions? No, they don't have any comments from my end. Okay, sounds good. Um, we'll take questions now. We'll start with uh, the House Vice Chair, Geraldine Valentino-Smith. Thank you, and and in you know deference to the Senate who's had a long day, I just want to preface a couple things, Madam Secretary, to bring them to the individual FIA budget hearing. And I want to, Thank you. I know you and all your staff have been under immense um, pressure with respect to the pandemic and the historic nature of people needing public benefits. And thank you for the extension on the foster care aging out in response to the letter. So just, just briefly or quickly, when you come, you said, I just, I'm not sure if I was hearing you correctly, on the TDAP, have you asked the governor or not asked the governor for an extension on the requirement for recertification and the documents? I said, um, after reviewing the trends and, and uh, analyzing the impact of the um, recertification had on our clients, a decision was made, and that's a decision I made on my own, a decision was made to reopen the cases and um, continue um, gen, um, issuing benefits. No, I understand. I understand you said you're going to reopen the cases. Have you asked the governor for an extension, or did you make a decision not to ask for an extension? At the point that the um, renewals were generated, we have made the decision not to ask for the waiver. As as the analysis says, um, we were reviewing the policy, what authority we had available to us to issue a waiver along with all the other benefits that we administer. So Mr. Chairman, if I may, just for a brief second, I am perplexed and concerned about the decision not to ask the governor for the extension. And I know that you recognize and we recognize the vulnerabilities of this population. The TDAP population, as I understand it, can receive only the disability benefit and some housing or SNAP benefits in order to qualify. They receive no other income. So this population is one of our poorest disabled populations that we serve in the state. If I, if I may add that, um, I, I, I understand, um, but I also wanna point out that um, they were also receiving um, SNAP benefits and Medicaid and um, we wanted to make sure that when, when administering the pro, all the programs that our agency administers, um, one looks at the broader picture, right? How many cases, as, as um, the analyst, analyst, uh, analyst said, um, will be coming up for renewal. And at that time, we also thought that, that um, having those cases recertify would allow then us to prepare for the TCA and SNAP cases that was the larger number for when the waivers were um, uh, expired. Well, well, we will, or I will expect or hope we can talk in more detail when we have your budget, but I see no downside and only upside to not only reopening the cases, but also asking the governor for an extension 
Um, with respect to SNAP, I just want to clarify before the, the hearing, right now, the recertification process ends in March. And in December, the main concern was the department made a decision not to reapply for additional waivers for the extension. One, because you testified and it was honest that you would be denied, so you didn't apply. Right now, under federal law, or what you anticipate, do you have the opportunity to request any additional extensions beyond March to anybody? To, to request from anyone, be it um, the federal government, be it the department. And if you haven't, has the governor voiced extreme concern to the congressional delegation about the fact that recertification will end in March? Because we saw 90% of the cases closed for failure to recertify, which was significant. As, as, as always, I would see any waiver that um, is, uh, is made available to us. And we will look into your recommendation and we'll have a response for you when we have our FI. Thank you. And then um, just a final question. A lot of historic providers we heard in the, in the uh, Department of Health overview yesterday, there's been a lot of effort with the care money to help ensure that historic providers didn't go out of business because um, of the impact of no longer having as many recipients. And so I know in your department, you deal with a lot of historic providers in the residential treatment centers. And, you know, in terms of the CARES money or in terms of the state's philosophy or policy, has there been any attention directed towards preservation of historic providers for the residential treatment uh, centers that you use? And um, if not, I guess why? There have been conversations, we continue conversations as the um, analysis says there was there was a 2% um, allocation for um, providers to acknowledge the work that they do um, on a day-to-day -day basis for us. And also when we were um, securing um, placement for children that um, had um, parents who were tested positive for COVID, um, we very quickly were able to um, identify providers and, and um, enhance their, their payment to make sure that um, placements were available um, for, for the children. And um, I, I, I don't know if um, um, Deputy Secretary um, James, do you have anything that you would like to add to my answer? Certainly, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, for the record, I'm Greg James, Deputy Secretary for Operations. Uh, I do want to mention we did provide supplemental payments to uh, the residential child care providers that we uh, license and use uh, to offset some of the increased costs um, associated with uh, dealing with the pandemic, whether that was additional food costs from having uh, children home uh, all day as opposed to being in school. Um, the cost, uh, the additional cost for cleaning um, and supplies, um, the additional staffing costs. So we have provided supplemental support uh, for those providers in recognition of the impact uh, um, COVID was having uh, on those. Um, and then certainly we've worked with the Department of Health with regard to residential treatment centers and, and uh, supporting them through this pandemic as well. Thank you, and, and I think the concern is on, not only on the childcare side, but on the residential treatment centers for these very complex children um, that have been sitting either in hospitals or we haven't had placements, but that they're unable to continue to stay in business based on COVID and that you're working with them in a plan. So I wanna thank you, Madam Secretary. I know that my question is not intended to be interpreted as any criticism of your department, but more to make sure that we now at the legislative branch really understand the significance of some of these policy issues so that we can take the necessary actions that we need that hopefully then can assist you going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the department? Seeing none, I'd like to add, um, so it, it won't be questions now, but I just wanna highlight two issues that I know that 
that you all know are, have been important to me and things that I have been following closely over the last few years. When we get to those specific budgets, um, I would like to do a much more thorough investigation of where things stand. Uh, you did mention both of them today and I appreciate that. One be, being the status and uh, spending on MD Think um, and the rollout as it's going. Um, the other being the, um, the uh, hospitalization of foster children and, um, and those in, in the, the care of the, of the department, as well as children who have been sent out of state for congregate care or congregate living. Um, those are two of the issues that I would like to make sure we spend a fair amount of time on when the specific budgets come up. Uh, so that's just not a question, just giving you fair warning that I will be looking into it. We appreciate that and we'll be ready. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. With that, we'll thank the department. Um, I will be needing my, my meeting got delayed for about half an hour. So I'll be leaving at, at 3.30 um, uh, and it will only be about a half hour meeting. I doubt we'll take that long. Um, but if I need to hand off, I will hand off to the, the good chairwoman from the Senate and my vice chair as well. Um, let's go to the witness list. I don't know how many folks are actually still on it to testify. So I'm just going to call names and we'll see whether or not uh, they are here to testify on this budget or if they signed up inadvertently for another, um, for another bill. So we'll start with uh, Robert Buchanan of Buchanan Partners. Are you here to testify on the DHS overview budget? Okay, not seeing. Uh, we'll go on to uh, um, Ilani Bui. Okay, only one. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. That saves a lot of time. Let's go. Uh, I'm just unmuting to say this. Probably. Um, all right, because we have three pages of people who signed up to testify, all of them inadvertently. Uh, so we're going to go to the one individual who's actually signed up for this budget, Carrie Selfutz. Uh, if you can um, present your uh, your testimony. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, chairs and members of the subcommittee, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Carrie Stoltzfus, and I'm the Executive Director of Food and Friends, an organization that provides home-delivered, medically-tailored meals and nutrition counseling to those living with serious illnesses, such as cancer and HIV-AIDS, who are too ill to prepare food for themselves. Operating across the Washington region, we serve seven counties in Maryland, where we provided over 500,000 meals to 1,400 people last year. Food and Friends plays a pivotal role for Marylanders in need of food security and preventative health care, and our services reduce the total cost of care for those with serious illness. I'd like to provide a quick update of our work in the last year. As you can imagine, the need for our services has grown during the pandemic. Those with serious illnesses are at higher risk of severe COVID infection and have a more urgent need to shelter at home. During the early days of the pandemic, we were faced with the unexpected cancellation of fundraising events, a surge of client referrals, and higher costs due to strained supply chains. Mm -hmm. In the second half of the year alone, our services in Maryland grew by 20%. Our clients are more vulnerable than ever and more in need of our meals than at any other time in the 33 year history of Food and Friends. I'm here today to say that we have persevered thanks to many participating in this hearing today. We would not have been able to meet the growing need for our services during the pandemic without the help of Secretary Padilla and her staff. Remaining in communication with us from day one, they helped to submit to supplement the increase in our services with CARES Act dollars that ensured we did not have to turn away a single Marylander in need. We're also grateful for elected leaders like you that keep our services in mind each year when you ensure our grant funding through DHS is maintained. So I'm here to thank all of you for making the seemingly impossible possible this year. Lastly, as we look forward, I want to emphasize the need for the state to continue pursuing a holistic approach to addressing the growing food crisis caused by the pandemic. 
Those in need of food and friends are too ill to make the trip to access other services such as food pantries. And while we continue to leverage our public support through fundraising from private sources, our relationship with Secretary Padilla and her staff at DHS, as well as members of this distinguished body will remain crucial to the care of vulnerable Marylanders as the increased need for our services will continue in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming and testifying, um, letting us know the work that you're doing. Are there any questions for this witness? Seeing none, we wanna thank you again for coming. Uh, that concludes the budget hearing for this particular budget. Um, I wanna remind uh, everyone we will be back again on Monday for um, another budget hearing at 1.30. We're gonna be doing the budgets of the Office of Healthcare Quality, the Public Health Administration of MDH, the uh, um, Home Energy Program Office of DHS, and that's it, those three budgets. Uh, and in addition to the members of the House, we will be on the floor for the very first time this session at three o'clock. So we look forward to um, 